Hello, my name is Marie Wyman, and I have a cable program called Close to Home in my hometown of Northboro, Massachusetts. Recently, I had a conversation with my cousin Emily Mazzola about a very special Norfolk firefighter and paramedic named Kevin Brady. He has impacted the community by being a role model for school children and Emily's two grandsons and his remarkable story of how he plays it forward because of a near-death experience as a four-year-old is a compelling example of how we all affect the lives of one another. In a world where parents are very concerned about their children's role models, we felt you would enjoy a story from the heart and more importantly, a story about someone who is making a difference. So, without further delay, it's a pleasure to introduce our guests today, Kevin Brady and Emily, Emily Mazzola. Hi, Emily. Hi, Kevin. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Marie. Thanks for inviting us. Oh, it's great to be here with you guys. I, I wanted to start off, Emily, by actually um, telling the, the audience how this all came about, this story about Kevin. Okay, um, I would say about a year and a half ago, I had my younger grandson with me, Michael, and we went into the Norfolk Fire Department, and Kevin was there, and, you know, I asked him if he could show Michael around. Is this, uh, you know, is it okay to just come in and do this? He said, oh, sure, absolutely. So we went around, and Michael was very, very happy to see the big fire trucks and the firemen and the gear, <laughs> and Kevin was so good with showing him around. And when we left, he gave him the little plastic hat with the M on it. Fire hat. <laughs> and he also had one for Michael's older brother, DJ. When I got back home, DJ was excited about it, but he said, Nana, when am I going to go visit the fire department? So a week or two went by. I thought, okay. We went back to the fire station. <laughs> and. Kevin was, was there. there luckily. Hello, here I am again. <laughs> and again, he was marvelous. He showed the boys around. They were extremely impressed. They asked questions. He sat them up in the trucks and, you know, just did so many things. And um, after all of this, I said to Kevin, Kevin, I'm just curious, like, what made you become a fireman? And in the lobby inside where the at the fire department, he showed me an article that really touched me, and it was all, and I'll let Kevin tell you the story on that, and I was extremely, I just couldn't believe that this story was on the wall, that people should know about this. Mm -hmm. So it has taken quite a, you know, time to <laughs> get the story out there, and then I remembered, Marie does this kind of stuff, <laughs> And when we met for coffee, I said, you know, Marie, I have a story. I've been trying to get it out there. Would you help me? And here that's, we are. That's how it <laughs> happened. Um, you, you, um, you joined the fire department in 2012. Yes. And you are a paramedic with the Norfolk Fire Department. Correct. But you actually were a resident of Hingham um, when you were a four-year-old child. Yes, And that's when your near-death experience happened. And yep. You want to tell us about that, Kevin? Yeah, so um, when I was four years old, um, my dad and brother and I decided to uh, work on my dad's car. And it was uh, the day that we had to change the oil. So my dad went out to the store, bought oil, and had it in the uh, passenger seat. Um, when we got home, he realized he forgot a tool. So he had to go back down to the uh, basement to get the tool. So my brother and I thought we'd get a jump start on the oil change. So um, the window on the passenger side was halfway open, so I put my bike right next to the window and stood on my bike and put my head in the window to reach down and get the oil. And that's when my bike uh, slipped out from under me and with the helmet on, my head uh, became wedged in the window on my neck, uh, accidentally uh, hanging myself. Oh my goodness. And you know, little children are so curious and inquisitive that you know, their lives can change in a gnat's eyelash. I mean, in a moment, you were actually suffocating to death. Is that correct? Yes. So my, uh, I was left there suffocating. So my uh, brother who was there, he uh, ran next 
uh, in the yard and grabbed a uh, three-step slide and he tried to put it under my feet to give me something to stand on to take the weight off my neck. Um, but that did not work, so at that point he ran and tried to get my mother. And your poor mother, I can't even imagine no. what that woman must have gone through in that split second to see her child. And, and she immediately called 911 and... She came out and when she saw me, my dad made his way um, out from the basement. He came running up. Uh, he grabbed me, yelled to my mother to call 911. Um, at that point I was completely blue mm. and they uh, took me inside the house. Um, at that point I ended up uh, going into cardiac arrest. and. Um, one of the firefighters from Hingham Fire Department gave uh, instructions over the phone to my mother for CPR, which she uh, then passed along to my father, who performed CPR on me. It obviously, got you out of the out of that situation and put you down on the ground and started working on you yep. with instructions from the the firemen, yep. uh, the, the the person on the other end of the line, which was amazing that they could keep their head and they and they administered um, CPR to you. Um, the basics to keep to keep your uh, you know your vitals going. What happened after that? So um, as my dad was doing this CPR from the instruction of the phone, they uh, dispatched an ambulance. Um, the ambulance arrived. They uh, were able to uh, revive me, uh, put me in the ambulance, and uh, were, took me to uh, Social Hospital, which was in Weymouth. Mm -hmm. um, so the two members on the uh, ambulance were just. Uh, EMTs at the time, mm -hmm. so they used uh, paramedics out of uh, social hospital and what they call chase cars. So um, they automatically called for them to start towards Hingham mm -hmm. for emergency. So um, halfway to the hospital was the um, where they connected, so they pulled over and the uh, two paramedics mm -hmm. were able to uh, get in and do some more advanced life-saving uh, maneuvers. And it's interesting that um, the article mentions that your father and his and his despair seeing the color of your skin and, and and thinking that you might have already gone but was relieved to know in actuality that the, um, the the quickest way to get more medical attention to you at that point in time was to have a, 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 another vehicle catch up with you and administer more advanced uh, life support. Um. Yeah, so the ambulance uh, pulled over with my dad following it and uh, he had no idea what was going on and he was, his first thought was he's gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then out of nowhere out of the corner of his eye he saw these two um, paramedics come around the corner with um, cardiac monitors and mm -hmm. different uh, medications and uh, so they were able to get in the truck and they ended up uh, intubating me which was putting a tube down my throat to uh, mm -hmm. help with my breathing so they made sure that uh, I was getting the adequate um, oxygen, oxygen I was supposed to. So and you wouldn't have any kind of brain damage. Yep. And this was back in 1993 and you were four mm -hmm. years old. Now of course they have obviously different types of, of uh, procedures in place but actually that procedure they had in the town of Hingham worked very well for you at the time. Very at that well. particular moment yes. in time. And I understand that from that experience um, the deep uh, feeling about what you wanted to do with your life was really a vocation. It came it yeah. came across as a vocation. And tell us about the, some of the things that, when you recovered, some of the things that you thought about as a young fella, and and wanting to go on um, and 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 be those people that save lives. Correct. Yeah. So uh, when I was recovered and made my way home, um, about a week after, um, I had spent a week in the hospital, and then I sent home, and shortly after. Uh, my parents took me down to the Hingham Fire Department and uh, I had some more interaction with the firefighters that helped me as I did with Emily's grandkids where they were able to uh, bring me into the station, uh, put me in the truck and um, really make me feel like I was uh, part of their family. So from that day forward I kind of set my goals to uh, make my life something to uh, give back to someone. and just didn't have the same interaction on someone's life as they had on mine. That's a wonderful, a wonderful way of playing it forward. And, and I think it's wonderful that the fireman who saved you, you're still in touch with him today, isn't that? Yeah, so one of the uh, firemen that was uh, on the call, I uh, grew up with his uh, daughters, so I uh, still keep in contact with him today. And, and both of them were recognized, uh, weren't they? Both firefighters got accommodations and uh, 
from the department mm -hmm. to uh, for the great job that they did. Mm -hmm. And now I think the connection that we were trying to make in the mm -hmm. community of Norfolk is that we have the kind of fire department, we have the kind of people in Norfolk that are really in this job as a vocation. It's not just a job for them. As you can witness by hearing what Kevin has mm -hmm. to say, it, you played it forward definitely and, and yeah, being absolutely. a role model for young boys like Emily's grandsons, it's truly, it's truly a wonderful thing. And, and tell me, I, I, I'd like to uh, ask Emily a couple of more questions about her grandsons, but more importantly, um, at this point, can you tell us the difference? I, I know we talked about EMTs, the difference between an EMT and a paramedic? Um, so EMTs, the uh, difference between EMTs and paramedics are considered uh, EMT works uh, uh, basic life support compared to a paramedic who can do advanced life support procedures. Um, so EMTs are certified in basic first aid and that kind of thing. Well, the paramedics are uh, a lot more schooling and they're uh, taught to um, use cardiac monitors and uh, we carry about 50 different um, cardiac drugs and different drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We do the intubation mm -hmm. now in the field so mm -hmm. there's a lot more advanced things we can do to help uh, save someone's life. And I understand that uh, the fire department um, uh, carries the Narcan, um, the, um, the medication or the drug that they give to someone who has an opiate um, overdose or... Uh, we do carry it right in Norfolk, yeah. Yep. And that's really something now that saves a tremendous amount of people. A lot of lives, it? yes. It, it, and, and back then in 1993, I mean, I don't really think they had that much available for that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm not sure what they uh, carried back then, but they did the mm -hmm. same stuff like uh, mm -hmm. intubations, but those we today carry a lot more mm -hmm. of uh, different medications. I know, Emily, that your mm -hmm. son lives in town and your daughter-in-law, and, and this has been such a relief for them to know that their sons were, that someone really cares about what mm -hmm. they understand the firefighters to to do as a job. I mean, that was very important, wasn't it? It absolutely was. It certainly made an impression on both of the boys. I um, bought, it had to be around Halloween. I'm not 100%, mm -hmm. but it had to be because I bought them firemen outfits and they continued to wear those and included in that was one of those horns. Oh, yeah. I mean, the parents weren't that <laughs> thrilled because it's a little bit loud, you right. know. But they would run around the house with these uniforms, or, you know, is it a uniform? Is that what you call it? That's yeah, it is really costume. a costume. I mean, unless it's in a costume, right. I mean, right. I don't want to get that. Right. But they were certainly mm -hmm. impressed by that visit, right, you know, a ride in a fire truck and just to see this big building and big giant trucks and, you know, pulling the horn, blowing the horn and pulling yeah. the bell. And what, what little uh, boys want to do? Hmm. What, what little boys want to do? Exactly. And I, I understand, um, mm -hmm. Kevin, um, that you go into the school systems too um, to educate the young children about the fireman's um, job and mm -hmm. and a fireman is your friend and you need to trust them in, yes. in case of an emergency, teaching your children how to dial the emergency numbers and tell us exactly what goes on when you go into this younger um, grades and, and what kind of age group are we talking about? So yeah, we have a uh Lieutenant on the job with us, Lieutenant uh, Mike Finland, who does a great job uh, starting off um, with uh, preschool children mm. and um, he involves some of the firefighters and then we'll go all the way up until um, first, second, third grade, that area to um, relay to the children that we're not someone to be scared of and mm -hmm. um, when emergencies happen and 911 is called and we need to come, things are going to be scary and that mm -hmm. they need to realize that um, it's the same person that you visited at the fire station that you saw in your classroom that's coming to your house to uh, help hopefully solve your emergency and mm -hmm. so we try and um, go through the different aspects of how to call 911, what kind of information to give, not to be scared and then um, as they get a little older we'll go in and we'll uh, go in the classrooms and we dress up the uh, usually the teachers so they see a familiar face and mm -hmm. do our uniform, the exact uniform that we wear every day mm -hmm. so that they can um, see that's just a teacher behind the uh, mm -hmm. mask that we wear and 
if uh, unfortunately if we have to come to their house in an emergency that it's the same person that was in the classroom that's behind the mask right. and not to hide and to come to us some of the help. That's right. Now, when we were young, they used to teach us to drop and roll and all that kind of stuff. Do they still um, do that sort of thing? Do they still give those kind of instructions? Yeah, to so the we youngsters? do a program with the uh, second graders actually mm -hmm. that um, we'll go in the schools and uh, we set up one of the hallways. Mm -hmm. We have a um, smoke machine and we'll teach them at the uh, how the smoke rises and then f goes to the ground. So. Uh, the safest thing to do is get as low as you can and crawl under the smoke. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't go to the ground right away. It'll stay above you at the ceiling. Mm -hmm. So your safest spot is at the ground and uh, we teach them different ways to crawl and mm -hmm. we do it in the hallway so they actually get to have a little fun within um, yeah, and, see what it's like sort to crawl of, and, under and, smoke. And it teaches them um, such basics that, you know, it's, it's funny how children absorb so much and they're so um, smart. I mean, mm -hmm. they can just, uh, it's unbelievable. How long does smoke, just for the heck of it, how long does smoke stay up um, uh, most of the time? Does it does it give you enough time to to actually crawl? Um, yeah, every fire is a little different. different. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the uh, synthetics that are in materials today uh, burn a lot hotter and a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. So the time is a lot less, but I mean, it's still a good couple minutes. and. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why it's so important now that we have um, the newer homes that are equipped with a lot more smoke detectors and right. early activation, right. and they're all hardwired in together. So if you have a fire in your basement in the middle of the night and the smoke detector goes off, it's actually going to set the detector off on the second floor in the bedroom, and all the detectors excellent. in the house are going to go off. Yeah, so, excellent. Um, excellent. You get a little, definitely mm -hmm. get a um, much quicker reaction time. And, it, and it's true, I think, that the synthetic materials mm -hmm. oftentimes have a, a, m a much more acrid smell and they can debilitate someone quicker too, isn't it? Is it kind of like... The yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's definitely burning a lot hotter and a lot uh, darker. Oh. So the smoke uh, is mm -hmm. a lot darker and it's almost like black, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely when you breathe it in, it's a lot worse than oh, lost. Yeah. Like then now, burner. when you when you uh, uh, decided that you wanted to be a paramedic and you wanted to be uh, employed in a fire department, um, how how did this all um, plan out? When was it that you decided firmly that you wanted to be a paramedic and a fireman? When when was that? How old were you about? Let's. Um, like I said, I mean, very early on in my life, I uh, was visiting with the fire department in mm -hmm. Hingham, and um, it was definitely something I felt was a calling of mine to mm -hmm. do, and mm -hmm. I mean, I had different thoughts. I definitely wanted to be in public safety, and I uh, was deciding whether I wanted to be a firefighter or a police officer, but I thought that uh, the greatest way to help someone like to help me was to Chase the give, of back. The give back. Give back. To give back. Give back. Yeah. Yep. And that's and that's what the program is about. Yeah. Today's program is about people that do give back to the community. Mm -hmm. And we have we I think myself the most and important recognizing and what recognizing what a real hero is. Exactly. These are the heroes. They, these are the people that give our children Absolutely. the positive role models that we're all looking for today. And I know you make a connection with children in a positive way and you play it forward uh, every time that you take young people through the fire department mm -hmm. and show them and treat them with respect and give them that role model, that component <laughs> that maybe they don't have. So that's one of the reasons why we're here today, mm -hmm. Emily, right? Exactly. And important for children everywhere that the fire departments in our towns give a lot back they play it forward every single day protecting us Correct. i mean he's part of he's part of norfolk but the fire department itself they give back constantly that's their job in every town and we have to respect that look at the firemen in 9 11. i mean they they Absolutely. sacrificed and the police and all the people that were in the medical right. profession that that you know gave mm -hmm. so much on that day of need right. and it's important for children everywhere no matter where they live to know that there are people out there like Kevin who put their lives on the line for them and care about what happens to them and their community. Mm -hmm. The future of our, our children is so important. Um, they need the positive models 
the role models. Mm -hmm. And this is why we're doing this program today. Um, if if a young if a young man wants to or a young woman wants to be a firefighter or uh, a paramedic, um, there is a there is training and there's a lot of schooling that goes along with it. But Kevin, tell us the most interesting part of your training as as a paramedic or as a, as well as a fireman. What do you think is most interesting to you? Um, so I thought I mean the most interesting I guess was the amount of actually time that needed to be committed to doing it mm -hmm. and the different um, life-saving maneuvers that we actually can do it just amazed me at the um, numerous drugs that are carried today mm -hmm. in the ambulance and uh, how there's a different drug to react with each problem that someone's having and mm -hmm. um, to actually be able to sit in the back of an ambulance with someone who's having their worst day possible and right. can, can completely change it around within a few minutes and have them um, a turn around a complete 180 is mm -hmm. completely amazes me. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the reasons why we wanted to do this program, not only to tell people about um, the so many aspects of being a firefighter or a paramedic, but because of your particular experience, you were fortunate enough that you had no because of the the, the, the uh, interaction with firemen and, and paramedics, you had no long-lasting effects, is that correct? Correct, yeah. So, I mean, they say now today with, I mean, if someone goes into cardiac arrest every minute, um, I mean, you can lose brain cells and have damage, but the fact that in 1993 the firefighters were so trained to be able to give instructions over the phone for uh, someone to do CPR and um, push on someone's chest and be able to move the blood through the system and keep oxygen mm -hmm. going to the vital organs mm -hmm. um, proved with me that I had no uh, deficits, which is amazing. And, and one of the things that I wanted to bring out too is um, if someone wants to learn CPR or someone wants to learn how to um, do the defibrillator, can you tell us a little bit about that? Now, you know, I know that in many places, um, a lot of gyms and a, and a lot of places, where people gather, they do now have defibrillators, whereas years ago they didn't. So can you, and, and, and CPR courses are readily available. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how um, our viewing audience perhaps might be able to educate themselves in those areas? So as far as uh, CPR goes, um, the American Red Cross does a uh, great job um, on their website uh, with having multiple classes in the areas. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll teach you the CPR and then they'll teach you how to use the AADs. Mm -hmm. The great part about the uh, AADs today that you find in your local gyms mm -hmm. is um, they have ins voice instruction with right, them. Right, right. So that um, if anybody isn't comfortable using it, you can still grab it and you can, um, actually the machine will tell you exactly what to do, where to place the pads. Mm -hmm. um, it will take a look at the uh, rhythm of the heart and then it makes a determination if you need a shocker or not and then you mm -hmm. just press a button and it's amazing it can just save a life and uh, right. help you right through it. Right and I remember years ago I took a CPR course and I, I, I haven't renewed it. Uh, how, how often do you have to renew that CPR? Um, is it every couple of years do you do so it? So it's every uh, two years. Two years, yeah, yep. that's what I thought. And and what about the defibrillator? Um, do, do, do regular um, people like you and I, well, not you, no. you're so special, <laughs> yeah, like Emily, be, yeah. my cousin Emily and I, <laughs> if we go somewhere and God forbid you see someone, um, do, do, what would, do, you know, do you, uh, how would you react quickly? I mean, if you can save a person by doing CPR but with, with your hands, I mean, would that be preferable to immediately calling 911 or how would you react in a situation like that? Or just start CPR and yeah, then call so 911? Yeah, the most important part, uh, I mean, is to get the CPR going and get mm -hmm. the uh, blood continually to move right. throughout the body. Mm -hmm. And that will keep the uh, vital organs oxygenated. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I mean, hopefully there's more people with you and someone yeah. can run for an AED. <laughs> I, know and I know it. And we're very fortunate that we have those defibrillators now. They and, they're, and, right. and they're so simple to use. And, and one of the things we want to wrap up our program, mm -hmm. and I, I want to reiterate about your two grandsons, do you think in the future that someday, I think, if, if 
this is my idea, some little boy is going to come up to him and say, I want to be a fireman. And then a few years later, when that mm -hmm. little fella is grown up and he's a firefighter and, and our Kevin here is a little <laughs> bit older, somebody will come up to him and say, guess what? You're the person that helped me make my vocation. I wanted to be Absolutely. a fireman and I wanted to save lives mm -hmm. and I wanted to be a paramedic just like you. Mm -hmm. So thank yep. you very much. You were my role model. I think that's going to happen, don't you, Emily? I do as well. And <laughs> I think that and I think that today we had a wonderful discussion about Absolutely. um how the community is so lucky to have firemen and paramedics mm -hmm. on their side and our team this is a team. I mean, mm -hmm. when you live in a town, it takes a village, doesn't it? Absolutely. And right. when we have little boys that live in town, mm -hmm. and little girls right. too, that look up to people like Kevin, that's a really positive role Absolutely. model. And I Absolutely. can't stress that enough because today, in this world, our children, it's so important for mm -hmm. them. They need the positive role model. They need the mentors like mm -hmm. Kevin. And, and if you would like, our audience out there would like more information, uh, find the department uh, um, on the website, the Norfolk Fire Department, or you could go to virtualnorfolk.org slash fire and learn um, more about what we were talking about today. And obviously, if you have young children who'd like to go to the fire department and talk to Kevin or see some of the firemen out there and know what's going on in your community as far as life-saving procedures and how lucky we are to have people like Kevin, it certainly would be welcome, wouldn't it, Kevin? Bring them on down. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, Emily, to, you, to your little uh, grandsons, God bless them. They are sweet little boys, and I'm so glad they had a great time with Kevin. And I'm so glad that you alerted me to this fine young man. And we need a lot more like him in the world, I guess. So mm. thank you, Kevin. Thank you very and much. And good luck in your future. Thank and you. And thanks, Cuz, for mm -hmm. bringing this forward to me so we could uh, tell the good people of mm -hmm. Norfolk what's, what's doing in their town. Mm -hmm. And thank thanks you. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. And I'll uh, see you again next time, hopefully. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>